Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our MSc Diagnostic Radiography pre-registration webinar this morning. Um, my name's Hannah Davis. I am the Recruitment Conversion Manager for the School of Health and Life Sciences, and we are joined today by Karen Brogan, who is the programme lead for the programme that we are hosting this webinar for. Um, just to make you aware, uh, we'll be recording this webinar so that we can send it out to everyone who can't make it, um, but also just so that you have a reference for everything that Karen is discussing today. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll just hand over to Karen, who will talk you through a short presentation, and then there'll be the opportunity for you to ask any questions you want throughout. There's a little public chat box there to the side. So please feel free to ask us any questions along the way. OK, over to you, Karen. Hiya, thanks, Anna. Yeah, so as Hannah said, my name's Karen Brogan and I am the programme lead for the MSc pre-registration programme in diagnostic um, radiography. So my background is I am a diagnostic radiographer that worked in clinical in Glasgow for a few years, we'll say. Let's just say it was last century I graduated. Um, so worked there for a few years before moving over into academia. And my background is that my specialism is trauma image interpretation. So if you attend a a &E department, for example, and you've fallen and hurt in your wrist, rather than a doctor reporting the x-ray, it's now it would now have been my job to do that. And um, so that was my kind of specialist area. What I'm going to talk to you today is about the pre-registration uh, diagnostic radiography program at GCU. I'm just going to give you a wee bit of background about GCU, a wee bit of background about the program, and then what I'll do is I'll open it up for you guys to ask any questions you might have. But as we're going along, if you've got any questions, as Hannah says, just feel free to pop them into the chat just on the right-hand side of your screen. So the programme um, that you've all applied for is the MSc Pre-Registration Diagnostic Radiography. So this programme is for people who already have a degree um, and it could be in any subject that are interested in training to become a diagnostic radiographer. So traditionally, the radiographers would do the BSc Honours programme, which is a four year programme. Um, and essentially what we've done is taken that, turned it into a condensed two-year programme because we do have the assumption that as you already have a degree, you will have the necessary study skills that we build the first two years of the undergraduate programme. Um, so that, that's kind of where the programmes came from. As I said, it's a two-year programme. It runs from January um, to two years in the January, so in the January 2024 program which is the one you guys will hopefully start on then you will qualify as a diagnostic radiographer in January 2026. Okay so why GCU? So in terms of diagnostic imaging which is our um, kind of bracket if you like there's four programs sit under the suite of diagnostic imaging programs at GCU. We are the largest provider of radiography education in Scotland so there are three different um, universities that provide radiography education in Scotland, and we are by far and away the largest. Okay, and we've obviously got a lot of experience between us in, in providing that education as well. We have dedicated simulation sites on campus um, that you will get to use as part of the programme. Uh, the one we use most is actually our simulated x-ray suite. So we have a state-of-the-art Samsung um, digital radiography unit um, that's in the first floor in our uh, university campus in the Govan and Becky building. And we chose that unit because it reflects accurately what you would use on clinical practice. And we pretty much get you in there from the first week you start university to get you started um, trying to use the X-ray equipment. We also have wards up in the third floor, and in that we can simulate when we're uh, radiographers are maybe having to go out into wards to X-ray really unwell patients that are too unwell to come to the X-ray department. So we have a mobile X-ray unit that we can take in, and we can actually let you again do this in a controlled, simulated environment before you're actually uh, dealing with patients. We also have an operating theatre. 
because again, one thing a lot of people don't know is that radiographers actually work in operating theatres. So if you've ever heard of anybody who's had a stent in their heart or have had a pins or plates put in for a broken bone, radiographers are actually there taking images while we do that. Um, so we actually have an operating theatre that we can let you in with equipment and let you practice manoeuvring the equipment and things like that as well, because it's all quite heavy equipment. Um, and the reason for that is that actually feedback we got from students initially was that that was one of the areas that newly qualified staff struggled with, not having much confidence. So again, we tried to tackle that head on and actually get you involved in that environment from as soon as we can. We are accredited by both the HCPC and the Society of Radiographers. So for um, those working in the UK, you need to be um, registered with the Health and Care Professions Council or the HCPC. You can see the real logo there in the bottom right of the slide. Um, they, they are the, the professional body, uh, sorry, statutory body for radiographers. What that means is you would get your qualification with us and then you would apply for registration with them, meaning that you can work in the United Kingdom. And again, that's one of the, the kind of big draws for programmes such as ours. Um, and if you're going to study radiography, I would certainly make sure that um, the programme you're studying will make you eligible to register with the HCPC if you're wanting to stay into the UK to work. I know there are a couple of people who are interested who are already qualified radiographers as well. And again, that's maybe one thing you want to consider as there's different types of master's programs. So there's the type such as the pre-registration, which gives you eligibility to apply with the HEPC when you finish, but it is training to be a radiographer, which you've already done. Um, and then there's the other master's programs, which is about enhancing your skills and advancing your practice. So that's for people who are already radiographers. And when you do that, you don't get the ability to register with the HCPC, you have to go down a different route for that and provide a portfolio of evidence to demonstrate that you meet their standards. Okay, doc. So, at GCU, the diagnostic imaging team are very much recognised for our teaching and our student support. And we have been uh, nominated, certainly I've been there since 2012, and we've been nominated every single year for uh, the recognition of our teaching and student support. So these teaching awards are really special to us. Um, even to be nominated is really special to us because um, it's students that nominate you. It's the people that matter that actually nominate you and you receive recognition for uh, the work with the people that actually matter to us. Um, and as I said, we routinely as a team, I would say at probably the lowest is about 80% of us getting nominated for teaching awards every single year. And quite often it's in multiple categories. So just to see, we've had shortlisted nominees for 10 years in a row. We've had winners in 2016, 2017, um, 2020. Again, we had another winner. Um, so, you know, obviously, as you can see, there are um, a lot of recognition of our student support. And moving on from that, we're actually first in the UK for um, radiography and that's the good university guide so that's from the times and the sunday times so um, this is quite a prestigious award to receive so for the second year in a row now so that's 2023 and 2024 we've ranked first in the uk not so not just in scotland for radiography subjects all right so we're, we're the top provider and even outside of that, um, within the subject area that we are in, that includes um, kind of different medical, uh, biomedical sciences and things like that as well. We, we're in a medical technology field. Um, we're number four in the UK. The three that are on top of us do not do, not, uh, do radiography though. And that's a jump up nine places from where we were last year. And again, the reason why these, this is really important to us is it includes factors such as student satisfaction with their teaching quality, the student experience, and um, the prospects as well as a graduate. And um, so it's really pleasing for us to see that we are number one in the UK based on those metrics. 
So diagnostic imaging, I'm aware, as I said, that some of you may already work as radiographers, but the majority of you won't. And so I thought it was worthwhile just to spend a bit more time on what is a diagnostic radiographer. So you can see here various images that radiographers would produce. So what we do is we carry out a wide range of different imaging procedures. We also do image interpretation. And essentially what we're looking at is to see if there's any pathology or disease within the human body. OK, ideally, there's not. And, we're, you know, everybody's getting me all clear, but that's essentially what we're doing. It's a great role for you if you're really interested in supporting and caring for patients um, and, and the kind of, I feel like, greater humanity. But you also really like science and working with technology. We use, you know, from X-ray units that are a couple of hundred thousand pounds up to, you know, MRI scanners where you're looking um, over a million pounds. So there is a wide range of very expensive technologies that we use. And in fact, one of the things I really like about radiography is that technology is obviously very much advancing. And, and over the course of my career, certainly over the past 25 years since I've qualified, Oh, that makes me sound really old, but yeah, 20, 24 years, we'll make it better, 24 years since I qualified. We went from where we had films that we developed and hung up to view to everything being digital now and all on computer. We're on the brink of potentially an AI revolution and um, how that's going to impact on radiology. So it is something that's constantly progressing and changing as technology advances. So just to kind of talk you through the images here at the bottom, the one um, over to the left hand side, you'll see that's an X-ray. This is a conventional X-ray um, of the shoulder girdle. So you can probably make that out as well. And you're seeing some of the ribs there just at the end of the slide. The image next to that is an MRI scan and we call that a sagittal slice. So that's actually just as though you've cut the body in half down the middle. Um, so again, you can see the brain there. You can see the spinal cord coming down. You can actually see the tongue and everything in the mouth as well. The image next to that is a chest x-ray. So that kind of white blob you can see there in the middle is the patient's heart. And the black areas that you can see are the lungs because the lungs, um, anything that's filled with air, uh, tends to show up dark on x-ray. And then the image to the further right is um, where we would uh, undertake in cardiology. So again, that's for MD who's had a, a suspected heart attack. And we're looking for any blockages in the vessels supply in the heart. So you can see just at the corner of the image next to the chest x-ray, there's a wee catheter there. And it's basically a wee tube that the doctor inserts into the coronary arteries. Then we inject contrast or radiographic dye. And as a radiographer, you would take the image and it's like a wee video, it plays like a wee film um, as the dye flows through the patient's coronary arteries. And what we would be looking for there then is anywhere where it flows slower or where it's narrowed slightly, because then we would put a stent in to help relieve the patient's symptoms. So as I said, these are just a few examples. So this is some of our students. Um, actually, they're all graduated now looking at them. But this is some of our students in our operating theatre. So this is a simulated operating theatre. This isn't actually in a hospital. This is about four doors down from my office. Um, and what we've got here is obviously we've got a mannequin on the bed, which is covered in greens. And we've got our extra unit. So that's called a mobile C-arm. Um, so it's small enough that we can move it about. And what the students are doing is just practicing manoeuvring it into all different positions. Because as I said, that's something you maybe don't get a lot of time to do um, when you're actually in a theatre environment. So it's just to give you that wee bit of practice. In terms of diagnostic imaging, then there is a lot of diagnostic radiographers who have actually extended their role. Um, so as I said to you earlier, um, I was one of them that has extended my role to become an advanced practitioner by moving into reporting services. Across the UK and across the globe, there are a lot of extended roles. Um, you're getting radiographers who are now leading services on their own. One example of that is in breast imaging. There's radiographers across Scotland now who are running their own clinics. So essentially what will happen is that women will attend with a lump on their breast. The radiographer will um, either perform the mammogram or another member of the team will perform the mammogram. They'll then report the mammogram, okay, so they'll see what's wrong with it. They'll then ultrasound the patient um, and ultrasound the lump. They can then take biopsies of the lump. 
and they can then give the patient their results. So they're running the clinics on their own now. One of the things that has been trialled down in England just now is radiographer-led discharge from a &E. So again, if MD attends a &E, it's taken on that next step. So as I said before, you know, if you came and you hurt your wrist, I would report your X-ray and let the doctors know if it was normal, if it was a fracture. But now what's happening down south is some of the radiographers are actually then telling the patients they can go home or here's your, your treatment and they're starting to do that. Um, research and audit is a big thing and we're trying to bring that in across so you, you will get taught research and audit as part of the course because it's a skill we want to enhance in radiographers um, and research can take many forms so in your dissertation you know it might be that you're wanting to compare two different methods so you want to compare CT for versus MRI and the detection of stroke you know, that would be research. It might be that you would do a literature search and find out what's available, first of all. Um, audit's really handy. And again, it can be really simple things like doing pulling 10 chest x-rays and seeing if they fit the proper criteria. So every x-ray that we do, there's at least 10 points that we're checking, criteria that the x-ray has to fit to be considered um, diagnostic. And as I said, image interpretation and commenting is something, again, there's a big driver behind that. There was um, guidance published from the Society of Radiographers actually about 10 years ago now, saying that all um, pre-registration, so first entry radiographers, as you qualify, should be able to provide a preliminary clinical evaluation on an image. So in other words, provide a comment as to whether you think it's normal or not. So we'll, we certainly do um, quite a bit of work on that as well. So in terms of work, um, I don't know how many of you have looked into the prospects, the career prospects as a radiographer. We are very much in high demand um, and that's globally. That's not just based within Scotland. We're on the home office um, occupation shortage list and there is a global shortage of radiographers. So you could pretty much pick where you want to work and you'll get a job there. In the UK, currently, um, radiographers start at fan five. So the starting salary is at the moment £28,407. Now, there, that does obviously change with the cost of living increases um, annually. So it probably would have went up a wee bit by the time you would graduate. Um, but at the moment, certainly when on our undergrad programme, because we've not had our first cohort of pre-reg going out, but on our undergrad programme, I would say probably at least 80 to 90 percent of our students, if not all of them, last year it was all of them, 100 percent of them had a job before they even got their final results. OK, so now what we're finding, certainly in Scotland, is that clinicians are actually contacting us to find when the exams are so that they can set interview dates and actually get you guys to come along and have jobs before you even finish um, and graduate, which is, is a nice position to be in. Um, and again, this is just some examples of the equipment that we use. So the image up the top there, that's a CT scanner. So that's a Toshiba Aquilion 64 slice scanner. And that's two of our ex-students with one of the radiographers that they're working on. Uh, they're working with, sorry. Um, so that's the kind of things you'll see out in clinical. And then down in the bottom corner here, in the bottom right, what we have, this is actually in the university. We have ultrasound scanners in the university. Um, and that was just some students practicing ultrasound techniques. And um, we also have simulated ultrasound. So you can actually um, try ultrasound without having a patient the haptics we've got give you the pressure that you would get because it's actually really sore on your wrist in ultrasound there's a lot of pressure that you have to apply so it gives you that pressure to give you the sensation as though you're doing the ultrasound but also lets you get images as well so you can um, check your technique so and as i've already said the course is about two years in length and with each group we'll have approximately 20 students probably a maximum of 20 students um, now, the programme is two years and it's a pretty intense two years. Um, I think that kind of surprises some people when they come, but um, there aren't really any breaks in the course. And that's how we've managed to take a four year programme and put it into two years. So you'll start in the January. It's usually um, induction will start mid-January and then you will 
do uh, your academic modules. So they'll be your anatomy, your physics of how x-rays work and your preparation for clinical practice modules. And you'll do them from January to uh, May. You'll set your exams in the early on in May, first week in May, end of April, beginning of May. Then you tend to have a two-day break and then you'll start clinical placement. And you'll do clinical placement from May to September. There is time in August where you will get um, you get a week inter, uh, inter trimester break, you get a week study leave, and again there's a two week assessment period. So you you are not attending clinical for that four week period over August, but you will be back out in the September. And then in September you will start your next lot of academic modules, and they'll run through to the January. Um, at Christmas, the university does shut for 10 days, roughly, so you will have that time off. And again, you'll have an inter-trimester break, a study week, and then an assessment period. And then it's straight back in to year two and starting your year two, which takes the same format as year one, January to May, where you're here on the university doing academic modules with us. May to September, you do your clinical placement. And again, that's full time. And then the September to January, you'll do your final modules, finish your dissertation and qualify as a radiographer. Now, as part of the programme, you will do interprofessional education. And what that means is you're working with other professions um, um, to work together towards a group task. And the reason that we're doing that is because that replicates what we need to do in clinical practice. You know, our patient is at the centre of everything that we do. And we need to work effectively as a healthcare team. Okay, so we're trying to build those skills in you. The layout of the programme is such that we try to do approximately 50% of your time is in academia, so in the university, with 50% of the time being in practice based learning. Okay, um, and you'll have slightly more practice based learning in level two than you would do in level one. And you also get to the opportunity to do an elective placement in level two, but I'll speak to you a wee bit later on. I've got a wee slide on that later on. Um, but that's kind of the general layout of the programme. In terms of our learning and teaching, then this is one of our wee classrooms in A135. Um, and that's just some students working. As you can see, they've got a, an anatomy, they've got a human body up there on the screen and they're labelling the anatomy. So there are a very, various learning and teaching um, opportunities, and we do try to vary what we do. Um, there are lectures, obviously, where we would come together as a group, and that's you know where the PowerPoints come out and we're conveying the information to you. We then have tutorials, and in the tutorials is where we would work in smaller groups. Um, and so if it was myself that was with you, I'd be going round, and you'll have different tasks set to complete as groups. And that's to help reinforce the information that we've delivered in the lecture. Okay. Now, these tasks may be scenario or problem-based learning. So it might be that you're in the X-ray suite and you're asked how you would X-ray this eight-year-old child who's come in and unable to move an arm. Um, it might be that you're asked to think of specific diseases and again, what would be the best imaging modalities for them, things like that. We have discussion groups as well. Um, we may ask you to do a debate, for example. We may ask you to role play, and um, particularly in the X-ray suite, to kind of work on your enhanced communication skills. There's seminars that will be led by yourself. So again, where we may be asked, what, what is it that you guys want to know more about? Or indeed, um, it might even be, we'll set you tasks and you have to deliver the learning to each other. Um, there's obviously also a large component of independent learning because this is master's level study so there is an expectation that you are aware um, and able to address your own learning needs to a certain degree. Uh, we do e-learning so there's um, for example two RAS modules that you have to complete before you go on to placement and um, so these are e-learning modules delivered by NHS Scotland and it's on things like hand hygiene, uh, manual handling, CPR, all the kind of skills that you would need to be safe to go into placement. There'll also be directed learning. So sometimes maybe we will set you a task for you to complete in the um, to complete in your own time. Okay. 
Um, but again, that's very directed and the outcomes are there to tell you what it is we want you to do. And as I said, placement is one of the best learning opportunities that you'll get. Um, and it certainly helps you hone your skills um, to become a radiographer. Assessments then, again, we have a broad differing range of assessments. These can take the form of courseworks, exams, practical based assessments. And I'll use the term coursework. Um, that could be uh, lots of different things. So it might be about writing a report. It could be writing a reflective essay on you know, your experiences on clinical. It could be, um, so for one of my modules, you do a wiki where we follow the patient's journey. So if they've had a patient with a diagnosis of breast cancer, for example, we would look at the different imaging modalities and the pathway that that patient would have through imaging. Um, exams, again, variation in exams. There's some of them that will be written face-to-face -face exams delivered on campus. Some of them will be electronic exams, which will be delivered through GCU. We have some MCQ, so multiple choice questions. Some of them will be more kind of longer answer questions, some short answer, because what we don't want to do is tailor something to one particular style of learner, because we're all very different. We want to give everybody an opportunity to achieve their potential. Okay, And again, a practical based assessments, again, these tend to be done in clinical um, and what we call staged assessments, where you will be asked to perform a chest x-ray or a hand x-ray on a patient and the radiographer assesses you. We also do continuous um, assessments at your in your final year. And during then, what you essentially do was you're in charge of the X-ray room for an hour and organising the workflow through that room for that hour. But you are obviously always supervised by a qualified member of staff. So as I leading on from that, your practice placements, as I said, you always work under the supervision of a qualified radiographer. And this is because obviously we're dealing with radiation. It's very closely governed, and um, you know you're you're not a registered professional at this point. So therefore, you work under a registered professional. We will be expecting you to do shift patterns when you're on practice placement, because that is the way that radiographers work. Diagnostic radiographer radiography is a 365 day, 24/7. You know there's. There's a radiographer in the hospital all the time. If there's an A&E department and it's open, there's a radiographer, at least one there, if not multiple radiographers. Um, so what we do try to do is get you to mirror some of that shift pattern to give you a real, ex real expectation of what the job is going to be. There's no point in us putting you nine to five Monday to Friday if that's not what you're actually going to work when you're a radiographer. Okay. So you will be nine to five initially, but then what we'll start to do is we would start to give you some evening shifts. So you maybe work to nine at night to get you used to that. A couple of shifts at the weekend to start getting you used to weekend working because it's very, very different. And um, we run different services. And then in your final year, we will start getting you to do some night shifts as well. Okay. On clinical placement, there is 100% attendance expected. That's not to say that you know you might not be uh, you might be unwell or anything, and that's fine. But you are expected to make those days up in your holiday periods and um, before being allowed to proceed to the next year of the course. All right. On clinical placement, again, as you can imagine, there's strict professional standards and codes of conduct that we need to stick to, and um, we certainly will be doing that. And that's the kind of things you're going to get taught in one of your first modules: preparation for radiographic practice. In terms of our placement sites then, we actually have 17 different hospitals that we utilise across West and Central Scotland. Okay, I don't know that MD that's on uh, is currently living in Scotland, but um, we kind of go from Ayrshire and Arran right across the centre of Scotland to Forth Valley. Now, all the hospitals that we use are within an hour's public transport from the campus, okay, not necessarily from where you live, but from the campus. So we try to keep them fairly local um, rather than you perhaps having to travel to Highlands and Islands and things like that. We tend to operate at what's called a hub and spoke model. So you would have a, a kind of base main hospital, if you like. So, for example, in Glasgow, that might be the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, which is one of the biggest hospitals in Europe. 
So that would be your base site, your hub, if you like. And the spoke might be that you work at either the Victoria Infirmary or the Western General. And that's because these are smaller, um, what we would call ambulatory care hospitals. So your patients are all walking wounded, day patients, they don't stay overnight. So it's to give you, the, again, that kind of broader range of what radiography is and the variation in working in a major trauma centre to perhaps a department that deals more with urology cases. Or So we try to basically um, broaden out your experiences. We also get you some placement time in the Royal Hospital for Children. So you get to experience some paediatrics because, um, again, there's a lot of disease, pathology, injuries that children have that you will not see anywhere else. So it's just to give you that wider scope. And again, because we're based in Glasgow, we're really lucky. We also have the Institute of Neurological Sciences based at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And um, they deal with brain and spinal injuries um, and brain and spinal imaging. And again, you'll see things there that you'll never see anywhere else. So again, it, it just kind of gives you that broader focus. Elective placement then in your final year, the, the last five weeks of term, so kind of mid-November through December, you are given the opportunity to do an elective placement. Now, your elective placement, you can go anywhere in the world that you like. The course is tailored that you can still uh, can attend any necessary classes uh, online. You can go anywhere in the world that you like, as long as you speak the language well enough that you could deliver medical information. Um, so Australia is really popular. Uh, Singapore is popular. Some, sometimes Amsterdam as well, because um, a lot of the... Uh, larger hospitals in Amsterdam, it's actually English um, in which is the main language in the hospital. Um, or a lot of people are strategic nearer the time because obviously it's right before you qualify. And what they do is they target hospitals they would like to work in. Um, so again, if you're maybe based at the Queen Elizabeth, normally you maybe want to go, if you want to stay in Glasgow, maybe go and try Glasgow Royal or Wishaw General. Um, but again, we can help advise with that. In terms of your elective placement, then you arrange that yourself and you are expected to fund that yourself. So if you are going to be going to Australia, please bear in mind, you probably want to start saving now. All right. Um, but again, we'll teach you more about that as you move into second year and give you the tools, because actually a large part of the learning outcomes for that module is your ability to um, design a project and your elective placement. OK. Radiography, again, as I said, is a, there's a global shortage of radiographers and there's lots of international opportunities as a result. We get people certainly from New Zealand. We had three students last year who moved to New Zealand. Um, so we do often get contacted by hospitals across the world interested in employing you and we pass on those opportunities to you. Um, but you can literally get a job anywhere in the world as a radiographer. And as you're completing a degree, which comes, you know, where you are able eligible for HCPC registration, again, that's generally well regarded across the globe. Um, if you are wanting to move to Australia, you generally do have to register with their governing body. Um, so you would have to supply some uh, transcripts and information for them. To move to America you, or Canada, you generally have to sit an entrance exam, but it's nothing that you've not been taught when you're with us, so it's nothing to be overly concerned about. If you want any further information, these are some good websites to look up. So as I said, the Society of Radiographers is our professional body. Um, they also have the College of Radiographers, which provides a lot of the educational um, input for the programme. There's the Radiography Careers website to give you an idea of some of the jobs that are out there. And also the NHS careers, because the majority of our students do go to work in the NHS. And as I said, there's also the HCPC, which is the Health and Care Professions Council. And they are the certainly the, the body that there are statutory body that provide our registration and as I said if you wish to work in the UK you have to have registration with the HCPC. A couple of other points to consider then for admission to the programme. 
you will be expected to get PVG or protection of vulnerable groups. So sometimes you hear that called disclosure Scotland. Um, we need enhanced disclosure because obviously we are working with very vulnerable people in a hospital. So you will have to get that um, on entry to the programme. And I believe currently that it costs £55. Um, you'll also need to undergo occupational health screening prior to starting on the programme. Um, and again, that's just in case there's any uh, vaccinations that you perhaps need before going on to clinical placement. Um, and again, that's about making sure that you're as safe as you possibly can be for clinical placement. Um, so again, it's making sure you're up to date with your vaccinations or if you do have any um, kind of medical considerations that we can take them into account when we're looking at your placement. OK, um, and basically it makes sure it's a kind of assessment for you to go on to clinical just to make sure that you're going to be safe. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we don't go or oh, you're unsafe and you can't go. What it does mean is sometimes that we would put in some kind of mediating factors to help you on clinical. Coming on from that as well, there's some, some great support networks in the university as well, student support services. So if anybody, for example, um, has ever ha been told they're dyslexic or have dyscalculia, you would go along to the student support services there. And again, what we would do is we work with them. It's not that you're off the programme or anything like that, which a lot of people worry about. It's actually that we work with them to, to tailor the learning to make sure that we're meeting your needs. It's called recommended adjustments that we would make in the teaching um, and considerations that we would make to make sure we're meeting your needs. Because um, as I said, what we're really keen is that everybody gets their opportunity to do the best that they can on the programme. There are some social media, media sites here as well that you can follow if you wish. Um, all of these are set up um, for the radiography programmes as a whole, okay? Um, so it will include undergraduate and or other master's programmes as well. Um, but again, it just gives you a wee feel of some of the things that we're doing here at GCU. There's also actually the Radiography Society, which is run by our students at the Students Association. And again, it's a great thing to get involved with, even as part of the committee or even joining um, because they put on CPD events, so continuing professional development events. So sometimes it might be extra anatomy teaching, or it might be that I'll come along and do some image interpretation, um, but they also do social events as well. So it's a, a nice way to meet new people because um, the programme you're on by comparison to the undergrad programme, the programme is quite small. Our undergrad programme this year was taking 86 into level one. So it's quite a nice way for you to socialise with other students that aren't necessarily in your programme. And that is all I've got to say to you. I feel like I've been talking at you for ages, so sorry about that. Um, I noticed that there is a couple of questions. Hannah's been doing a great job there answering them. Um, I did see there was one about an anatomy table. We do not have that as yet. Um, we don't have that, no. It's something we actually looked at before, but we, we don't have, and I don't see us getting in the near future, but you never know. Um, but we certainly don't have one. We tend to stick to our, we've got our, our models, if you like, um, which are kept downstairs in the cupboard. Um, so we have a lot of mannequins and different uh, models that we can use for our anatomy teaching. Uh, does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Just to say, Karen, thank you so much for that presentation. That was very, very interesting. I actually learned a lot from that. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, just to say, there was another question in the chat about the slides for the presentation. Yes, they will be shared. Um, we've actually recorded the webinar itself. So that will be the link to the webinar will be sent out to all those who have attended, but also anyone who hasn't been able to make it just to be sure that people know they'll, they'll get access to it um, and also just to mention there's a couple of students who are messaging directly just now Karen just talking about you'll see in the chat just around um, their specific requirements to go onto the program or deferred status or whatever so I might I might share that detail with you just following following the webinar if that's if that's okay um, but yes any other questions 
please just let us know. We'll stay online maybe for another couple of minutes and just see if there's any questions that come in. Um, and if not, then free, free to kind of wrap things up and we can see whether or not um, we can see if any yeah. comes in the meantime. Yeah, so I see that somebody's asking about the clinical admission um, and want to study MRI in more depth during a master's degree. So what I would say is um, certainly, so we have, what, what can sometimes be confusing is that we have two different master's programs. So we have the master's pre-registration and diagnostic radiography, which is this program. And as I said, it's more tailored towards um, people who are not radiographers and training them to become radiographers. So Sanam, I don't know if you're already a radiographer or not. Um, however, if you are not a radiographer, what you would need to do for, is do a programme, first of all, to, to get your radiography degree, okay, whether that be the pre-registration master's or the undergrad BSc honours. But then what you would do is our other MRI programme, which is our other, sorry, master's programme, which is a master's in, in moving towards advanced practice. So that is people who are already radiographers and are wanting to do advanced skills. And that's when you would study MRI in more depth. So you can actually do, we have specific MRI modules and there's an MRI pathway that you can do to become a, a specialist in MRI, okay? If you follow that pathway, then we are, I think one of the very few um, so if you're already a qualified radiographer and that's what you're looking to do, we're one of the very few universities that actually does give clinical placement as part of that. So you get it's 12 days at one of our local sites. And if you're either on the MRI or the CT pathway, you will have 12 days in M either MRI or CT working with MRI specialists. If you're not, and it's this programme that you're wanting to do, the pre-registration, so if you're not a radiographer, um, and you're wanting to train to be one, you will still get to do MRI. So we do have modules in which we look at CT, MRI, ultrasound, but as part of your clinical placement, and this comes to us kind of giving you that broad sweep, you will attend MRI, you will attend CT, ultrasound, because we want to give you that as broad uh, understanding of what radiography can be and what you can make your career as you move on, okay? Um, so you will actually get into MRI and things like that as well. But if you want to specialise in it, then you'll be moving into that as a, again, as a, a master's, a, as an advanced practitioner. OK. It is absolutely um, admirable to go on and do your PhD and we would fully support you with that. That would be great. Um, so you can have a master's and then move on to PhD. Absolutely. Um, that's a great pathway. To, to go and again I know a lot of um, certainly international applicants that's the pathway they would like to take so there are some PhD opportunities come up through the university um, and there are scholarships associated with that and actually we've got so we've got um, certainly one of the radiographers in the team at the minute has completed her PhD and actually produced work which was ref returnable, which is a big thing for a radiographer. Um, so if you don't know, it's the research excellent frame, excellence framework, and it's not often that radiographers meet that. Um, so that's our head of department, Dr. Diane Dixon. And there's actually another four members of the team just now doing their PhD. So again, by the time it comes for you to do a PhD, there'll be a, a masses of supervisors in our, in our team. Um, so that will be good. Uh, absolutely, I'm more than happy to share my email address. In fact, I'll type it in here. It is, sorry, I can't type and talk, but it is karen.brogan at gcu.ac.uk. Oh, and that's came up as all. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Sorry. Um, send. There we go. So that's my email address there. Um, absolutely, radiography is the eye of medicine. It absolutely is. And actually, um, of all the people that attend hospital, 90% will attend radiology. They'll all go through radiology. Um, you know, we, we provide so much information and um, so much input into treatment pathways for patients. 
um, and that's that's a really good thing because sometimes one of the things people aren't overly keen is that you know we don't we don't see patients often we see them for a few minutes here and there and you know we're not necessarily involved in the, the building a rapport with them however what I would say is that we have to build a rapport with a patient in a matter of minutes to get them do to undertake an examination which let's face it is not always the most pleasant it can be painful if you imagine if you get a fracture in a bone and we're having to move your arm it can be painful so actually we have to have such enhanced communication skills to be able to build that rapport and work out within a matter of seconds what's the best way to communicate with that patient yeah um and I'm glad you're liking the diversity. We're, we certainly try because, as I said, it's really important to me that whatever your potential is, that that you feel you've met it on that on our programs. Um, because you know you you all have your own personal goals. You all have, and and by creating diversity, and actually you guys are are fantastic because it's the students that create the most diversity because they give us the challenge of having to produce all these different items with the different learning skills are um, kind of making sure we're meeting them. Um, and that's always a good part of our job. So that's good. Um, fully funded scholarships, not at the moment. Um, there's nothing that I'm aware of at the moment. Um, sometimes there might become some like kind of one-off scholarship opportunities. If I become aware of any of them, I will certainly um, forward them on to you to make you aware. Um, so last year, for example, the Digital Health Institute were funding some master's programmes and for the first time ever, they included our programme on that, um, even though, because they're, they're now considering us in a way as part of digital health, because I suppose we are teleradiology and digital health is a big part of radiography. Um, so again, if I if I hear of anything, I will certainly send it round to you. But and I know it's it's certainly, you know, there's obviously a financial consideration to come and to study this programme as well. Um, it's it's certainly not it's not cheap. It's not expensive in terms of education elsewhere, but it's not cheap either. I appreciate that as well as factoring in moving to a new country potentially as well. Um, Kazakhstan, I don't know. OK, so the difference between this course and diagnostic imaging essentially is this course is for anyone who has an honours degree at the UK equivalent of a 2-1 or above to train to become a radiographer. OK. So you may not be a radiographer just now. You could be an accountant. You might be a physicist. You might have studied biochemistry. The diagnostic imaging program is for people who are already working as radiographers and they want to enhance their skills. OK, so that's the two. That's the main difference. So unless you are a diagnostic radiographer, you cannot get on to the other program. OK. OK, so the timetable then, um, yeah, so the timetable, what, what we do try to do is uh, timetabling is done by a central timetable in office. But what I usually try to request is that you're not coming in for just two hours one day, two hours the next two hours. So currently, our level one students, um, so bear in mind, this is their, their third trimester, they're in on a Monday from 1 to no, 11 to 1 and then 3 to 5. And then they're in a Thursday from 9 to 12 and then 3 to 5. So the rest of the time that they have is for their directed learning, OK, and their study skills, etc. But yes, it does mean that you also have the availability to work. So a lot of the international students, I am aware, are working. Um, they're doing their 16 to 20 hours to meet their, uh, obviously not to breach their visa requirements. Um, and we, again, a variation of jobs this year. I've had a few of the first years who are going out and getting jobs um, in carer roles. So again, the, using that to help enhance the clinical skills. So they're working as carers. And they also, I, 
another student who's actually working in McDonald's and loving it. Um, so, yeah, there's a variation of different roles as well. We also have a careers um, office on site at the university as well, who specifically advertise uh, jobs in which people are looking for student employees. OK, so again, there's, there's help available in the university services to help you find work that's suitable for students as well. OK. So we've, we've got it all worked out for you <laughs> before you even get here. So we're seeing you from Kazakhstan, Sari. Excellent. I don't know that I've had anybody from Kazakhstan on the programme yet. That will be a first. I've got just now we've got a couple of students from Nigeria. We've got students from India as well. A few from Scotland, a couple from England as well. Not a MD from Ireland yet either. Um, yeah, but actually I think the African nations, Nigeria is the only um only students we've had, but the, to be fair, the programme is only has only been running for two years, so I'm sure we'll be broadening our horizons soon. Does anyone have any other questions? Any other questions for Ted before we get ready to sign off? I have to say this has been a very, a very um, busy and bustling webinar. It's been fabulous. So thank you everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank you for asking questions. It's always nice when you get questions. Yeah, yeah really engaged. Yeah. Now, if anybody is wanting to contact me, this is my disclaimer. But after this, I'm actually going on holiday. So I will not be back to the 23rd of October. Um, so if you have any questions that you can think of, by all means, contact me. But please bear in mind that it will be the 23rd of October before I respond. And it'll probably be later on because I'm pretty much teaching all that day. Um, but I will get back to you because I am aware that obviously the, the deadline, certainly if you're an international student, the deadlines for payments and um, visas, etc., are looming. So I will make it my priority to respond to you. Um, just just an answer to that last question there around admission to the programme. So um, we do have deadlines for the, the payment of deposits, and I suppose that would be the kind of last day. I need to actually look up those deadlines and see if I can just post them into the chat for you um, because they've recently been amended. Um, I'll just see if I can find them while we chat. Um, but essentially, that would be the day after which no other applications would be except for January. Um, so let me just see if I can find it for you. Sorry, Karen, you might need to... No, you're quite all right, yes. Um, are, are most of you international students then? I've seen, um, obviously, we've got somebody from Kazakhstan. Actually, there was a few of you at uh, Birmingham, is that right? We've got mm -hmm. Manchester, uh, I see from the beginning of the chat in Birmingham, great. That's not too far to travel, certainly Manchester. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm, I'm flying from Manchester tomorrow. Manchester's probably about three, three and a half hours drive, although I wouldn't recommend uh, commuting that length every day. Yeah, maybe just a bit no, too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to say, I found it now. So the deposit payment deadline for international students for the program is the twenty fourth of November. So there's still roughly six weeks. Is that about six, seven weeks until yeah. the deposit deadline? So up until that point, um, applications will still be open as long as you can get your deposit paid before the twenty fourth of November. Okay. Um, Karen, also just to say what I might do is because I've had one or two individual chats um, with students, so I'll see if I can catch you before you go, just have a wee look at them. Um, but if not, 
just to let you know, anyone that I've had kind of one-to-one chats with here, I'll pick that up with the admissions officers while Karen is off, um, just so we can get some answers for you if you're still waiting for um, clarification on what you need to provide. We can get that sorted for you in the meantime, okay? Um, but I think that's everything for me. I think that's everything from you, Karen, so you can get yeah. in your holidays. <laughs> um, I'll be online for the next half hour. <laughs> yes, next next 30 minutes. Um, oh, sorry, one more quick question. The deposit for international students. I need to just double check to make sure I get the right amount for that. Give me two seconds. Oh, you go. Was it up there? £4,000. £4,000, yes. There we go. Um, right, okay. Yes, so that is me. And thank you so much, Karen. Oh, thank and you. I'll send out the recording to this webinar to everyone so that you've got access to the slides, okay? But thank you so much for joining us. This has been a really informative session and thanks for all of your questions. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, bye, -bye. bye. bye.